morning, everyone. Welcome to the UBC Learning Circle, hosted by the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. Uh, my name is Cole, and I'm here. I'm uh, really happy to welcome Elder Larry Grant from Musqueam, my Hwayathanuk, uh, somebody who taught me language. I'm really excited to have him come and join us, and we can have a <coughs> chat about language and language revitalization in their community um, on the circle today. Uh, so normally I would do the territorial acknowledge, but since this is um, Larry's territory, I'd, I'd welcome you to, to start us off in that way. Thank you. I think the coolest part about going to uh, to learn in the classroom from you is that I can actually understand <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of the, the welcoming when yeah. when Larry and I first met years and years ago I, I could never understand. It made it harder to connect to what was being said, but that's really <coughs> nice. Um, so, moving on with the rest of our normal opening spiel here. Um, as I said, my name is Cole and I'm from the Shelvetal First Nation. Uh, other Learning Circle team members in the room today, but off camera, are Cynthia, our production coordinator, and Kaylin, our program assistant. Um, and then one final thing before we kind of jump into it. Some of the topics we cover can be sensitive or emotionally triggering, uh, especially for those of us that have been involved in language for a long time, so this can bring up some feeling. Um, so I want to recommend that if that's you for today, please go and talk to an elder, friend, a family member, a counselor, whatever support system it is that you utilize, please make sure that you do so today. Um, so mm -hmm. with that, I think I'm going to turn the mic over to you. Uh -huh. uh, so um, the question was kind of who you are, where you come, when, where you come from. Uh, I'm a... Uh... My name is Larry Grant. I'm from the Musqueam First Nation. Uh, we're the people that have lived on this delta probably the last 10, 12,000 years, maybe longer. Uh, and when the Ice Age left, we were living on the uh, at the mouth of the river. Mm. And as the delta being formed, we would keep moving down and living at the mouth of the river. So about three, four thousand years ago, we ended up uh, in the village that we're in now called today Musqueam. And we've lived in that area in all of that time continuously, 3,500, 4,500 years. And yeah, so that's really what Mm -hmm. Where I'm from? So. Where you're from, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Grew up right next to the water. Yeah, right by the river called Fraser now, today. Mm -hmm. so. Was there a uh, traditional name for the river? Uh, traditional name for the river is Stalo. Hmm. It's the go. river. The, the word river. Cool. The river, yeah. The word cool. for river, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so I thought we'd begin the conversation with, um, as we talked about, the historical or a localizing portion. Um, so first basic question, what language do you speak? We, uh, our community called it Hunt Gaminam. Uh, linguists call it Hulk Amelum. Okay. Um, and it's uh, our old people that used to speak our language never liked that. That's an upriver language. Hulk Amelum. Hulk Amelum, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually the same language. It's, uh, there's three main dialects of that now. There's Halkamalam from upriver, uh, roughly from Sumas up into the canyon, and then Sumas, Quantland down this way to Point Grey is Halkamalam. And on Vancouver Island, from on the east coast of Vancouver Island, from roughly Comox down to uh, uh, hmm, just to the uh, Saanich Peninsula, it is Halkaminum. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, the third major dialect. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take into account all of the micro dialects that existed within the regions in the region prior to the Indian residential school 
uh, stopping the usage of language and that uh, now when everyone is relearning and trying to become fluent in their dialects are basically being taught singular dialects rather than a multiple mm -hmm. set of dialects. And yeah. It was quite apparent when we were kids so that uh, really uh, uh, was always interesting because you, you can pretty well tell what village everyone came from. Today, now, it, uh, you have to guess because mm -hmm. uh, uh, they are learning a singular dialect. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, so that, yeah, it <clears throat> must be difficult just based on the way that people learn language now, I suppose. Whereas before it would have been done, I would well, imagine, at your grandparents' feet, right? Because right, you learn right. your language. Well, right from the time you're in the womb, mm -hmm. in your mother's womb, you're hearing Hunkaminam or whatever dialect it is that your community speaks or family speaks. Because mm -hmm. there are micro dialects within the dialect. Mm -hmm. uh, all, some, because of intermarriage and sometimes a, a, a way of speaking is not able to uh, readjust to, to imitate the regional dialect or the local dialect. And uh, you would hear that and as you're born your mother would be speaking, our mother would be speaking to us in, in Hunkaminam. Uh, she wouldn't have those really, I think, how I, I view new mothers that truly emotional connection you have with a newborn baby to speak a different language to your child. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you would be speaking whatever your mother tongue is. And then our grandparents who were, they were there at that time of my birth, they would be all talking in Hunkaminam. And uh, it was, uh, and then through our childhood, uh, we learned to respond. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was because of the brutal treatment our community children were receiving from the Indian residential school for speaking their own languages. Mm. Uh, our parents and grandparents didn't uh, require us to fully learn our language as long as we could respond to it. Mm -hmm. So we, we grew up being silent speakers or letting our ability to speak just let it go mm -hmm. because it was a, a survival instinct. So that's really how I think of our language and how it's taught at that time, everything was hands-on. Uh, yeah, it was all hands-on learning, which is normal for any language group. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a child running around here, and the parents are speaking in whatever their mother tongue is, and the child begins to learn that. And as the mother is washing, cleaning up, uh, taking care of the child, she's speaking in that language, and you're, you're learning all that time. Mm -hmm. uh, body language is really reinforcing the things that you need to understand about your language. And today, we are trying to learn in a classroom setting, mm -hmm. which is, a, which is a, a very abstract way of learning languages because there's nothing to put your finger on, nothing to see, nothing to talk about. It's, it's all hypothetical. It takes the context out of learning the law, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the challenge with that is you're trying to embed language into another person's mind and you're not able to because there's nothing to refer back to it. It's just uh, an abstract sound in your mind that comes from another language and you can't, 
it's not a normal way of learning language, mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, that's one of our biggest challenges. But because we don't have uh, this hands-on learning process developed yet, uh, we are teaching it in the way that some of our old people tried to do in the 1970s when they began to learn a little bit about linguistics mm -hmm. and second language teaching to try and bring that about because the parenting generation were not speakers. So the grandparent generations trying to develop curriculum to mimic uh, uh, the things that are done within your language. And the difficult part about that, though, is because you are not conversant in the language, you're not able to make contemporary conversation mm -hmm. because you don't have the words. You have to create new words, and that uh, we felt was not in our domain as teachers or learners, that it would come about in our children's and grandchildren's generation as they were learning. As, uh, as in all languages, uh, a lot of major changes happen with the children, with generation. the children's generation speaking, mm -hmm conversing back and forth with the adult uh, or, or extended family, creating new little words or cute little words that stick in your mind and, and that all of a sudden becomes part of your lexicon. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, something that uh, we had hoped that our future generations would be able to move into that realm. Huh? Mm -hmm. um. <clears throat> So I just want to chat a little bit more about, um, I guess you, you kind of brought, brought it up, and I thought I'd bring us back to it. So you spoke about how um, difficult this, uh, this process was for people of your generation to, to learn your language and to keep hold of that language. So I guess my question is, what was it like to come back to that language for you and, and rediscover it um, or to, to use it? And what is that emotional journey like to see it being now something that's treasured, right, and, that, and mm -hmm. that people want to learn. It's such a difference in your lifetime. Well, that was a, a huge, huge uh, uh, emotional journey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I actually originally enrolled in the language course in the second year of its existence in this form. Mm -hmm. When was uh, that, by the way? 1998. Been around for a while. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, uh, because it, I, uh, the first class was in 1997. I didn't didn't enroll. Uh, mm -hmm. And younger brother said, "You get a UBC number, you know. If, if you go and you go, you can have lifelong learning. You can have all kinds of programs you could take." Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Well, I was preparing to retire from. My day job. What was your day job? I'm a heavy duty mechanic. Uh, my trade is an automotive machinist, hmm. um, rebuilding engines, mm -hmm. re remachining them and uh, putting them back together. Um, and, but the 30 years I was a, a maintenance mechanic in the longshore industry. So that uh, was a Big move, financial move, really. So, so that I was getting ready to let that go and retire. And young brother said, "You need to do something." Mm -hmm. I said, "You don't understand English. What does retire mean?" <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, you've worked since you graduated from high school, six and seven days a week. Mm -hmm. You're gonna die if you just switch off. If I switch off, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I said, "Go to UBC, and just you know, just fool around." Yeah, okay. Signed up. I figured, yeah, four years I'll be out of there. It's three, four years in the language 
just fooling around in the language program, mm -hmm. just keeping myself busy. Uh, but once I enrolled and classes started, I didn't realize the misconceptions that were there about our language. Mm -hmm. uh, linguists would say it's a dialect, uh, but our community always said it's our language. Mm -hmm. So the misconception is that the people of Musqueam, the mainland, the downriver dialect people, and the people upriver, that there was a formal language that was used in ceremonials, uh, performances, not perform, uh, uh, ceremonies. Ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, and it was the Vancouver Island dialect. And uh, I said, no, wait a minute. So that's what they were teaching back then? Uh, no, that's what they said. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the other members that were in that class I was in in oh, 1998. Okay, yeah. Uh, I said, the official language in our big house ceremonies is the Vancouver Island dialect. I go, no, it's not. I have no memory of that mm -hmm. as a child. Yeah. It was always the down river dialect. And they might have had a second speaker on the floor that would reiterate whatever was being said in our dialect mm -hmm. into the Vancouver Island dialect. And our people would not use someone else's dialect in their house. Yeah. So it became a challenge. Mm -hmm. So that created a challenge for, uh, and that created that understanding that, hey, there's something in, uh, in this class that's not right. So I have to try and ensure that our dialect survives in, in everyday conversation, plus our ceremonies, so that young people that have never heard our dialect on the floor mm -hmm. in ceremony. Uh, because when I was a young man, our last public speaker passed away. Mm -hmm. And two young men took over. But they were speaking, they spoke the island dialect, mm. very much different from the people that were there just before they took over. Right. And so now from the 1970s until now, that's what they've heard on the ceremonial floor, mm -hmm. the Vancouver Island dialect. And I said, that's the only reason why uh, we have the Vancouver Island dialect on our floor because we don't have a public speaker. Uh, we don't have anyone confident enough to go out there and speak on the floor. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not that that's the way it should be done. It's just yeah. done out of necessity. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I ended up staying in the class. But that relearning language, learning how to analyze it, all the morphemes in the language, was highly, highly emotional. Mm -hmm. Things began to come out of my memory. Words, phrases, images. Old people would talk to me in my dreams. I started to dream about old people. Uh, in Hunkaminam. In Hunkaminam, yeah. It was it was really uh, emotional. It's scary, too, because uh, culturally, if you start to dream about old people coming to you, <laughs> it's usually your time is up. They've come to mm -hmm. greet you and take you away. 
And that was the added emotion, besides dreaming about uh, old people uh, and and Hunt Kaminam language. So, but I was reassured by other people, though, that those old people are just here to help you, because mm. uh, they're not they're not calling you. They're there just talking to you. So, so that was the real scary emotional part. And the first time I spoke, because this was the class project. Uh, they still did the class project back still, then? Yeah, <laughs> they, they, they just started the class project. Okay. And uh, my, my, uh, my project was I want to learn how to do a welcome and mm -hmm. a thank you. Yeah. Actually, not a welcome. Was it? I just want to thank you. Uh, and and uh, the old lady that was still alive that did you want to say? Yeah, I want to thank. Them. I want to stand up there and say thank you all for coming here today to listen to us. And I thank all of you here for spending time with us. That's it. That's all I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. That's actually all I wanted to learn. Uh, but then it grew. It just it got added on to the teaching team and have stayed in there for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. And there you are. Yeah. And now you teach, the, or you help to teach the first year class. Now. Oh, yes. I helped to teach the first year class, the introductory class, along with uh, my co teacher. Young lady. Uh -huh. right. Don't know if I can use her name or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So uh, we have our first question or comment from Davida. Hello, Elder Larry. Uh, oh, sorry. It's from Robert Clifton. Elder Larry, Robert Clifton here from the Gitagat people, Hartley Bay. I was honored to sit with you two weeks ago to talk about language learning. I really appreciated your points you made about how we must return to the land to learn our languages, <laughs> as well as the challenges of elder purism versus the transmission of learning languages through technology and what is lost or gained by returning to the true immersive ways of lang learning language, sitting and listening and learning in context like we talked about. Uh, I'm wondering if you can share some of these points, against it, uh, points again today. So maybe to, to break that down a little bit, what does he mean when he says elder purism? Is that like really sticking to the traditional way that it was spoken? No. Uh, if I'm interpreting that correctly, that question, it, uh, the, the thing about uh, how we consider elders today in today's contemporary academic world, uh, elders are considered old people, intelligent, knowledge carriers. Mm -hmm. uh, in the earlier days, uh, many young people were considered knowledge holders and very astute at what they did, but they were not old people. A lot right. of younger people, like we have today, 30, 40 years of age, carry huge amounts of cultural knowledge mm -hmm. uh, and, and don't consider themselves elders. Where a lot of older people, it's, I'm an old man, I command respect because I'm an old man. Mm -hmm. And that's not a reality when we were young, uh, a lot of old people, because that was certain areas of every society is of interest to certain people mm -hmm. and not every people. So there's certain things that you're very, very astute at and other things you couldn't care less about because mm -hmm. you're not interested. Uh, you, you, you don't want to be doing some kinds of things in your life, so you don't do them. You do other things. And uh, today a lot of 
people say, well, you're an elder, you should know, You, how about this, how about answering this or that or that, how, how do we look after this, how do we do that, how, uh, mm-hmm. and they carry that as a, as a power symbol, mm. a symbol of power, but it's not. Being an elder, being a teacher is not about power, even though it's viewed that way in a lot of places. It's about knowledge and passing of knowledge in its correct form, whatever it is that you're speaking about. And as an elder, and I'm going back into my mother's and grandparents' time, People passed knowledge, showed other people how to do things without expecting exorbitant amount, what I consider exorbitant amounts of remuneration. Uh, Usually your remuneration was at whatever the person you're talking to or passing knowledge to or or showing them how to do ceremony. They're, whatever it is that they thanked you with is what is what the value of it was. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a monetary value. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was what the families could give. It's whatever, whatever that person or family could afford mm-hmm. and how they took care of you to repay you. So it was always in kind somewhere, and it wasn't uh, wasn't just a, uh, carrying a, a position of power. <clears throat> you carried a lot of that knowledge, but you didn't use it as a as a tool of uh, of power. Mm-hmm. It uh, learning humbleness, how to be humble. How, how to be assertive and uh, humble at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's what you need to do with, uh, as an elder. And, uh, and not having to, and really actually understanding what you're talking about in the sense and not uh, doing your best not to embellish anything. Mm-hmm. And, and, and mm-hmm. that, that's all part of that. So. And it's challenging to pinpoint it. Yeah, yeah. well, it's a big topic, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> um, thanks very much, uh, Robert. I appreciate that. Um, we're actually going to get to the second piece, the transmission of learning languages through technology, as opposed to uh, returning to the immersive way of learning language, the way that you mm-hmm. learned it originally. Yeah. We're going to get to that a little bit later in our session today, so maybe we'll yeah. just hold that question. Okay. And we'll move on. Um, if anybody else has any other questions, please make sure to throw them in the chat box. So thanks again very much for, for, uh, for putting that in there, Robert. I appreciate it. Um, oh, we actually have a quick question just from LJ. Wondering what the age is for someone to be called an elder. So as we talked about, I think it's a difference of like <laughs> um, position. Like some communities will define an elder as an age. and then But I think traditionally speaking, the, the way that it was done in community, an elder would be more of a position that you grew to regardless of age. Yeah. Is that kind of the point that you were making before? No, that's the point I was yeah. making. Yeah, yeah. 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 Because uh, <clears throat> you can become an expert in, in certain areas, uh, and, the commu- and you become the go-to person. Mm-hmm. Uh, for that thing. For that, that thing, yeah. whatever it is, uh, whatever function that you carried out in that very expert way defined you as a, as a CM in that uh, that discipline. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Whatever ceremony or whatever it is that you're doing. If you, if you were the best carver of masks, uh, that's where they would go to. Mm-hmm. Uh, they wouldn't go to someone else that couldn't do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, if you were the best fisherman, then they would go and talk to you. How do I do this? How do I do that? How do I do that? And and the best tracker, hunter, best fisherman, the best processor of our foods and medicines. Mm-hmm. But in today's world, 
because it's, a lot of these elder things are budget controlled. Mm. <laughs> so it's a becomes a budgetary thing. Like a business. So, um, at Musqueam, uh, our programming, our, our senior elder programming begins at the age of 60. It's the same for my community too. Uh, for a while it was 65 or 70, and then it was dropped, and then it was raised again. Uh, at the whim of some of the more vocal elders, <laughs> mm -hmm. trying to manipulate who could be part of the program. Yeah. So, it's, uh, so that's w what's going on right now. There, the actual age is not the determinant. Uh, the age is the determinant for budgetary reasons. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it could be anywhere as 40 onward as long as you're knowledgeable and honest about your work and uh, your knowledge and that you're not uh, not embellishing your degree of knowledge so mm. that uh, really really is how an elder be you you work your way into it yeah yeah yeah, I think there's a lot of kind of confusion that comes about uh, that way. And that, to me, it's like there's two, um, it's like a double meaning in that. When, yeah. when you say elder, elder in the community mm -hmm. can can generally mean anyone of a certain age that, that uh, requires or carries respect just based on the fact that we as a community, and mm -hmm. or at least in my community, look after those that, that mm -hmm. are older and pay the proper respect for them of living a long life. And then there's that other meaning of elder, which is kind yeah. of what you're talking about, yeah. and that they're knowledge keepers and knowledge holders. So... I think particularly as communities, when we start to liaise with um, external organizations, um, you know, like health authorities or whatever, mm -hmm. and, and they have elders as paid positions, like yeah, you're talking yeah, about, yeah. then it, it becomes a little bit <clears throat> foggy uh, yeah. uh, as to what is what. Um, but I think traditionally we would have just known in communities who is uh, CM and who is elder, right? You're right. You know but, what I mean? And, and where those distinctions lied. See, this is like... Uh, uh, Was it Sila? Grand, is Sila's grandparent, yeah. Hey, CM Sia, is, is, is a respected one. Mm -hmm. But then there, because there, it's like uh, who takes care of burning the food for the dead uh, at the time of burial or other times? Mm -hmm. There's certain people that can do that, have been, have learned and earned their way into it. And they become the go-to person, and, and a lot of them are in their 30s mm -hmm. because they've done this work ever since they were little children, assisting their parents or grandparents. And, and they already know all of the things they need to know and keep working with it respectfully. And uh, the community will say, oh, go and see Cole. He does this all the time, mm -hmm. you know. Even the, uh, and Cole won't say no unless he has to be somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So he's dependable. He knows what he's doing, and he's always grateful that you've asked him. I am, and uh, yeah, uh, that that's the other challenging thing about that age-related thing. Age versus knowledge-based relationship. Yeah. Definition and uh, and the word elder actually stems from church. Mm -hmm. Elders, uh, the way I understand it, uh, uh, through the church way, is an elder is one that goes forward and teaches the gospel mm -hmm. uh, and teaches the word of God around the world. Mm -hmm. And that elder could be 20 years old uh, in, in some Organizations, some religious organizations, and uh, oh yeah, I yeah, know yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about the Latter Day Saints. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, they they go on a mission in their twenties, uh, and their young people passing on whatever their knowledge is about the Bible, mm -hmm. uh, their Bible. So 
uh, and they're classed as elders. We don't have a word for elders uh, in that in that form. Uh, all we have is shialakwa, old person. <laughs> <laughs> so, no. so that to me is uh, where we sit today in a sense, and, and how uh, many times I have a challenge depends on the audience and what's bothering my mind at the moment. Mm -hmm. Say, I'm just one of the old guys from Moscow mm -hmm. that people have turned to. So uh, don't ask me why, but they've turned to me and uh, I, I know stuff, but I don't know all the stuff. I know parts of a lot of stuff and certain things. And there's certain things I don't do because I've never been trained in it. Yeah. You know? And other people do that. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks very much for... Um, uh, so then LJ has a follow-up question. So is it more culturally appropriate to use the word old person? Thank you, LJ. Um, well, uh, Larry, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, yeah. I think, but, if, if I may, just for a moment, yeah. um, when, I, when I address uh, elders, I always lead with that title given its contemporary context now. Um, so when I first started chatting with, with Larry, I would always call him elder, um, or I would call him my Huyathanuk. Uh, which I believe is like cultural mm -hmm. teacher kind yeah. of, right? Yeah. Um, because he was my language teacher. <clears throat> so once we got to know each other and we have a personal relationship mm -hmm. now, I know that Larry actually just prefers to be called Larry most of the time. So I call <laughs> Larry Larry, right? But there are other people that that like the, the title, like the title elder. It makes them, um, it's a title of recognition ultimately. Yeah. Um, so I always lead with that unless, uh, unless indicated otherwise. Or in this case, mm -hmm. in Hunkaminam, it would probably be more culturally appropriate, given our la given our shared mm -hmm. language experiences, for me to call him my Huyathanuk. But um, yeah, no, the yeah. The, uh, the old person just standing on its own, standing alone in that phrase. It's uh, elder. You would say, CM Hialaha, respected old person. Yeah, CM is generally just yeah. respected person, right? Yeah, person, uh, and, and today the word CM is 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 really overused. Mm -hmm. yeah. When I was a boy, CM that word CM was used for people that were truly accomplished in cultural uh, teachings and and. and uh, other knowledges, uh, and today we use that because of the English connotation of Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Yeah. Uh, CM comes across all the time, and it's, it's used in a different uh, cultural way today, but Sialahua is an old person, uh, and depending on on what language you're, you're you're coming from, to call to say respected old person, it, it's it's more normal. Yeah. I think the other thing we're kind of touching on here as well is that difference in in culture. Mm -hmm. um, where Sialawa yeah. was probably would not be considered a derogatory. No, statement, not derogatory. At all. But we can see like just based on kind of Western or European influences and the influence of ageism and that a lot of people kind of uh, look down on older people mm -hmm. in contemporary cultures. So you can see where there's that negative connotation to the, to the phrase like old person. Mm -hmm. But we have to recognize that that's yeah. just fundamentally different in many, not all, but many indigenous communities. Yeah. Whereas an old person would be respected as you wrote in age just based on their, mm -hmm. on, on their age. Yeah. So it's an interesting kind of weird place where the culture is kind of yeah, butt heads a little bit. Yeah, it does. Terminology. Yeah. So thanks very much for your, for your questions, LJ. I appreciate it. 
Uh, we have got a little bit off track, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but that's okay. That's the way these conversations happen sometimes. Uh, so I wanted to touch a little bit more on the language program in Musqueam itself. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe kind of walk us through how your language program works for anybody that's never seen it before? Mm. Okay. The way the program was set up uh, basically re reflects the, uh, how it started off in the 70s. Uh, the program lasted a couple of years uh, and for financial reasons collapsed. Mm -hmm. uh, and today, in partnership with the University of British Columbia, we were able to set up curriculum reflecting that original set of curricula mm -hmm. uh, books and and right now, we do the the way we do it is we teach you, we show you the language, we show you the words, uh, and we give you sentence structure. Like each, how are you? Mm -hmm. People say, how do you say hello? I say, well, we don't say hello. Mm -hmm. We're like, the majority of cultures around the world. It's, how are you? <clears throat> then all of a sudden, we can write it down because we use an international phonetic alphabet for, for our orthography. And we got, we have six words in that. Each while. And our community goes, what do you mean six words? That's only one or two words. But it, it's it's six tiny little words, mm -hmm. and uh, we try and teach you that. We try and show you how our words are made up. The sentence structure is a word order. Uh, we can replace the verbs, replace the objects, uh, we can replace the subjects. But as long as you learn the structure, you're able to uh, uh, create sentences or, or write it down and we try and work with different word lists which is a hypothetical thing we work with photographs uh, uh, identifying animals and uh, male female things like that and uh, it's really challenging to do it, but that's, we don't have uh, a mother tongue speaker in our community. So we have to work from archival materials and recording, the sound recordings, and then try to create that uh, everyday conversation out of it. Because most of our stuff is, there's not real everyday conversation recorded. Mm -hmm. uh, as people understand linguistics and language uh, preservation, it's most, more about structure of language, the formal forms of the language, mm -hmm. uh, and not everyday banter. Yeah, yeah. they would have recorded that, right? They didn't. You know I mean? They didn't record it jokes. They didn't. They didn't record smart aleck remarks. Uh, they didn't. Yeah. Uh, so some of that is coming out of memory. Uh, every once in a while, somebody will say something in the community. There, something pops out, and we try it uh, today. Now we we are able to have our lessons fully online given that uh, you have access to it if you're a registered student. But if you're not a registered student, it's not available to you. So we have uh, all, all our complete lessons are, are on uh, online here uh, at UBC. So that's all part of that, which has been a really, really big uh, help because now we have certain words that were used all along uh, to help 
learn how to pronounce the word because we have uh, 22 different sounds in in our language that are not in uh, English and it, when it's online now uh, they can access a singular word as many times as they need to or as many times as they want to mm -hmm. uh, and and we already know that uh, uh, in the early childhood education research that you have to repeat it around 400 times to embed the, the sounds and the word in the child's mind. So it, it's, it's a real challenge and, and not being uh, uh, hands-on, the retention is quite challenging. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's the process we have at the moment. We're trying to, with our process, we're trying to create people that can create a capacity for passing it on in the correct way. Mm -hmm. Because our, our word order is, is different from English. English word order is backwards to Hunkaminum, mm -hmm. as it is backwards to many other languages in the world. So we have to try and embed that because English is so pervasive that the word order starts to creep in if you don't learn the correct word order and have it embedded mm -hmm. uh, prior to learning how to speak everyday conversation. So that's approximately where we're at today. Um, I know other communities have moved on into immersion, but we're trying to work or build our capacity to the point where we can actually do immersion for three or four hours. Yeah. So that. Uh, so let's just take a let's take a step back here for people that maybe aren't as familiar. When you say immersion, do you mean like? Um, fully immersive like in the language everyone speaking the language or do you mean it at a specific age like an immersive program that would be aimed at you know pre-k or well, or kindergarten age students well in the, in this context uh, i i know we we don't have one we don't have any mm -hmm. uh uh immersive programs uh, we don't have more than 20 minutes in a day for our preschool or uh, we don't have we don't have a community school mm -hmm. We have a daycare uh, and, and a preschool program. And those are the only two children's programs that we have. And uh, our language program, <clears throat> they try and teach some songs. They do teach songs in the uh, uh, preschool program. and. When they reach the age to attend kindergarten, they leave the community. Mm. Uh, and almost immediately, all the little children uh, stop using Hunkaminum mm -hmm. because they don't hear it anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and the class that you guys do have is primarily an adult-based class. Yeah, so ours is adult teaching. education. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, It's a university level. It's, it's a university accredited course. Um, and you have to register at UBC to attend. And we do have a, a, a working agreement with a couple of high schools that the grade 10, 11, or 11, 12 student uh, can come and attend the university accredited course if the school gives permission and the parents give permission. Mm -hmm. Because now the, the high school students in in an adult setting, that uh, it's a little different. there's liability concerns. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it's, it's very different from a community school. Yeah. yeah. And, and we don't have a hands-on program with language in any of the, the, the community programs that we have. Like, like we do have uh, 
fish processing, but we don't have anyone in there that is conversant with the language to pass it on in that manner. Mm -hmm. So we don't actually have a, a language camp. Mm -hmm. so that's a really big difference in the way. And a lot of uh, other language programs have been running for four or five decades mm. already. Uh, and they're just now moving into uh, language nests. So they've been at it for approximately 50 years in some of the different communities and are just now moving into uh, immersion classes where, where, it's, uh, where it's infants and K to five or four. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so you can see how, how that would be difficult for communities as well, though. It requires quite a bit more resources, right? Well, we're one of the few communities that doesn't have a, a, a speaker base. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a first language speaker. And it's quite different from other communities that might have 10 or 12 or more. Mm -hmm. people that still speak to be able to assist in creating something that's in immersion. So, uh, so that, that's the hard part, I think. Uh, I, I know that the hands-on learning is more successful, but hands-on learning has its challenges also. Mm -hmm. because we have a polysynthetic language and we can have three prefixes, three suffixes. We could have an L infix. We could have reduplication. We could have continuative reduplication. We could have... Uh, miniaturizing reduplication. We could have miniaturizing plural continuative reduplication. You're talking about all the different ways you can you can modify a yeah. verb, right? Uh, modifying the root word. The root word, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. I remember we started going into this in second year, and that's when I conveniently <laughs> stopped. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, it, as a child, you just learn it. Yeah. You learn the pattern, it's when you're a uh, but it's hands-on. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's commands, it's telling you, oh, yeah, go get the book. It's not that book. Go, go out there and get, go get some firewood. Mm -hmm. you know, go out there and chase the chickens and bring them in. Mm -hmm. you know, or, or you go with your uncles and do this or do that. Yeah. So, so you learn all that. You, you learn how, uh, all, all of those different ways of changing the the root word that as an adult you have a real challenge figuring out the patterns mm -hmm. and as a child it just happens uh, and we know that because uh, a child is an empty is an empty empty book mm -hmm. a child is empty minded uh, it's not full of and uh, uh, another language and it's not locked into the the main language uh, your mind locks into it mm -hmm. uh, your your main main language you a child you could speak to a child in five different languages if you did that continuously every day that child would come out learning and speaking five different languages mm -hmm. but once they passed puberty become go go into adulthood it locks on to the main language that is spoken around that child mm -hmm. uh, and then it has to be deconstructed to be able to absorb anything else uh, and uh, not everyone has that capacity so in place of the uh, of immersive programs right now you guys are doing adult-based education with the goal that 
then community members and others can then take that mm -hmm. and bring the language to their family yes. so that it starts earlier and younger mm -hmm. and they can yeah. they can hopefully go about it that way in their own homes. So we've been uh, working, hopefully, in, uh, uh, encouraging parents to attend with their children, parents to come into the pre school class, parents to attend the adult courses with their their children. So we need we some. in our class. Who had a baby in our class? Was, uh, was it Amanda? Oh, Amanda. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes, she, yes. She brought her baby a couple uh, times. Yeah, yeah. See, that, that's real neat. Uh -huh. See, uh, and right, the last couple of years, we've had actually familial cohorts. Mm -hmm. Grandparent, parent, child. Uh, this year and last year, sisters. <laughs> and then this year, the same family, the grandmother's in there. Mm -hmm. So you've got grandmother, child, grandchild, mm -hmm. cohort in there. And they said, that's what we've been looking for. We've been trying to encourage that because you can't force people to come and learn language. It's important to them, but life doesn't allow for the time that's needed to learn language. It's a big investment, yeah. especially as an adult learner. Uh, and we say, well, if we can get a couple of brothers and sisters or mother and child, then, then there's someone to talk to, someone to expand with. Uh, and it'll come, but it'll take time. And, from your perspective, it's really about giving families the tools that they need oh, yes. to, to revitalize language in their own in yep. their own families. And, and to understand also, like like the adult part is, is understanding all of those pieces I just spoke about uh -huh. in how to construct uh, an amazing word out of a short little root might be just four, four, four symbols in the root. Mm -hmm. That can can all of a sudden grow to about fifteen symbols, and every one of them, every one of the morphemes, have with a, with a meaning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and just to get to that stage is is really challenging, uh, and to be able to pronounce them. Uh, I had that advantage of my memory, mm -hmm. and understanding, of hunkaminum. But I still had challenges. There's words that uh, there there was words recorded that I heard as a child. They were soft fricatives in there, the the <laughs> sounds mm -hmm. that the English speaking ear doesn't pick up. I never realized they were in there. Mm -hmm. See? Because as, as a child, you, you, you hear things and you don't hear things, and it takes a while to, for you to pick it up. And I probably stopped learning before I picked up all those little, very subtle nuances. And then listening, having it digitized, listening to the digitized tapes, and all of a sudden, boom. It pops out. You can hear it. Yeah. Yeah. And, hey, wait a minute. There's a fricative in there. Yeah. Uh, and, you, and then you write it all down and you look at it, look at it. Oh, yeah, that's real. That fricative is real. It's not just an accident of pronunciation. Mm -hmm. So that, so we're researching, reanalyzing, and trying to teach all at the same time and try, uh, learning. Yeah all at the same time. And our students are helping us because the students come with amazing questions. Mm -hmm. you know, how do you say this? Or, or the student will say, I hear something in that recording. What is this? Because I don't hear you saying it. You know? And you go, oh, okay. Let me listen. Oh, wow. 
there is a sound in there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So those are the, the goals that we have, is to be able to analyze, hear it, pronounce it, and use it in its right context. Because mm -hmm. singular words are normally out of context. You're not able to give definitions for them. People will come and say, how do I say uh, he's done or, or he wants to do this? Is it, yeah, but what, or, or they'll ask you, how do you say invite? Invite for what? Hmm. Or how do you say he's a creator? Creator of what? You have to have the context. Because uh, there's no English translation to our, our words. Mm -hmm. So you have to have all of the context all of the time, and that that that's the other challenge. Yeah. And then the other challenge that you have with archive materials, depending who the transcriber is, if the transcriber doesn't like the plain, simple language that is used in English and transcribes it into, like, like from a grade five level to a post-secondary level, trying to describe the same thing. So sometimes you have transcriptions like that, mm -hmm. and you look at it, and they say, well, can you transcribe that back to Hunt Gaminam? You look at it, look at it. Uh, I'm not sure what he means by this word. No, this word could be this word, this word, this word, or this word. You mm -hmm. know, I mean, now which one is it? Mm -hmm. uh, and those transcribers are not here anymore. Yeah, uh, it's a challenge. So, so, you, so, what was the original word that that person used? Direct in English. literal translations yeah, or as yeah. close as possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, because a lot of people might have had grade four, grade five education, yeah. formal education. So that's yeah. the way they speak. Then you go, um, oh. and not that they speak incorrectly, they speak at that level. Uh -huh. And bang it. You need that exact word that they used. Um, so we're, we're coming very close to the end of our time here, and I wanted to get at one more question mm -hmm. um, before we kind of wrap up. Uh, it's coming back to Robert's question about uh, the transmission of learning languages through technology and what is lost or gained by returning to the true immersive way of learning language, like we spoke about, sitting mm -hmm. and listening to, um, to your parents' feet. <coughs> so I guess my question is, what are your thoughts on, on those two different learning modalities and how... How can we try and navigate? Because a lot of the time, like you said, like for for Musqueam as an example, you guys don't have a speaker. You know, nope. there, there isn't there isn't Granny that you can drop the young ones off to listen to her yeah. speak, right? Yeah. So how do we how do how do we walk a path that way? Do you know what I mean? Uh, well, it, we have to incorporate everything that we can, mm -hmm. uh, and create different ways of uh, creating a reality. Uh, it, it could be using puppets, could be using carvings, could be using toys, dolls. Or through technology, like Robert says. Uh, and uh, using technology, well, this is technology because it's, it's a different form of uh, it may not be digital technology, but it's mm -hmm. technology. Yeah. Uh, we're using puppets to assist the fantasy in your mind, and we can create that to create a hands-on scenario. 
Then we have the IT stuff using Skype, using videos, using recordings, which can be very, very accurately repeated thousands of times, mm -hmm. where in its normal form, language, words are said in a different manner almost every time you utter it. It's organic, right? Yeah, it's organic. It all depends. Uh, you might have a hiccup. You might have uh, some saliva. You could have a, a mental trip, mm -hmm. uh, trip over the word, and uh, it's it changes every time you utter it. Mm -hmm. uh, but technology can give you that same sound over and over and over and over. And how I feel about technology is you lose that one-on-one, -on -one, you lose that face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. you lose body language. Yeah. Communication is probably 90% body language and 10% words. Mm -hmm. That you can talk, I don't know, the ones of you that have wives, <laughs> your wife can talk to you for a long time just using her hands and her body and her face without making a sound. And I know that many of us have mothers with eyes that say, you're going to get it. Mm -hmm. And she hasn't said one sound. Mm -hmm. See, this is what you miss, and this is what you lose, the, the intonation, the inflection, and the real meaning of the sentence that you're uttering. Uh, uh, but using in technology, you can learn to say that sentence very accurately so that everyone in the language program that you're in can understand you. Yeah. Uh, but the, the, there's, some people can really learn hypothetically. Mm -hmm. Others can't. Others need. It, it, it's like geometry, physics, uh, trigonometry. You can do that in a shop setting. You can be building something. Uh, you could be machining something. You can come up with all kinds of answers just by going through the motions without writing it down on paper or seeing it. Uh, you lose all of that in, in some of the IT stuff. And some people can't learn without seeing it. They know how to play soccer. They know where, how far to kick the ball. They know where to run. They know when the ball is going to get to where they're running to. Or you pay, play billiards or snooker. You have to know all the angles. You have to know how to get to those angles. So you learn mathematics, physics, chemistry, and, and all of that that you can't get in the IT format, mm -hmm. and, and that's that's what you lose. But also, you don't you don't retain it in the same. You don't learn it as quickly, and you don't retain it as long. Or there aren't as many things to tag that memory to. Yeah, that's you right. Know, if your mom tells you off about something, oh, you, know. you can remember the words she said. You can remember the tone of her voice. You can remember the way that her face looked. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? So there's lots of different things you can use to try and help you bring yeah. those, those yeah. words back. Whereas if you're just listening to a recording, oh. it looks the same every single time. It's yeah. easy to lose. And you, you, you can learn to say it correctly, but then you don't know just how to change the inflections mm -hmm. in there. Yeah. To to mimic the original language, yeah. you you can get it so that your your inflections are English, or or German or whatever. Uh, 
if you don't have that uh, face-to-face contact with a language speaker, that's that's conversant in the language. Yeah, so that that's a really big challenge in my mind, mm-hmm. uh, because because uh, all of this plays into foster care. <laughs> And I know we're not talking about foster care. <laughs> <laughs> not today, not in the last no. couple of minutes. <laughs> no. And to me, it's, uh, you can have a child from another culture trying to explain to them about their culture, and you could have an unconscious bias not liking that culture, and your body language is going to tell it mm-hmm. to that child. So that's how important that is, uh, learning face-to-face and one-on-one and on the land or, or, or in the process of doing things. Mm-hmm. It's, it's so important for that. And uh, many people don't realize that. Mm-hmm. So we have one final question again from, I, be, I assume it's from Robert again. Uh, can you speak on language learning when drumming and singing? Is there a benefit? To putting uh, attaching the language to the music, uh, drumming and singing is is, is really a, uh, a great way <clears throat> if you're using language. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you're just using uh, uh, the humming part of it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't give you language. It gets you in the mood or the mode. (laughs) The drumming and the humming gets you in the mode. Then you do the language. People can sing. The other challenge, though, is having the courage to stand up and beat the drum and sing. You you have all of those things that we just got through talking about. Mm-hmm. You've got the hand motions are going. Yeah. The, the the rhythm, your body starts to pick up a rhythm. Mm-hmm. And then you can hear the sounds and you create the sounds in your mind because all of this other stuff has filled your mind. It's if you're able to stand up there and and, and sing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it takes your mind away from concentrating on the word and trying to be correct. It, it eases that it that that stress that's there for for language speaking and learning. Mm-hmm. That when you're singing. Your whole body is working on it, and that's all a complete way of learning language. Mm-hmm. You're doing something, your mind is remembering the rhythm and the beat, and your body starts to move, mm-hmm. unless you're a robot. You know? But then it's that singing and drumming is like listening or hearing hearing the theme song of Sesame Street your body goes right into that then and your mind goes there so that to me is the value of drumming and singing learning language I think another good benefit as well just from like a, a neurological standpoint is that the the language that you use when you sing or when you know when you hum along you, we all know it you know you you can go 10 15 years well hearing a song yeah, yeah. and your favorite song comes on the radio yeah. for some reason or another and you remember every single word yeah. even though if you would have not if you would have done it without the the music yeah. you never would have remembered it mm-hmm. right um that's because music and those lyrics are stored in a slightly different area in the yeah. brain and they're accessed yeah. differently um so i think as as much as we can yeah. to try to make language learning as as uh, as all-encompassing mm-hmm. in the mind, yeah, yeah, yeah. learn it through yeah. language, mm-hmm. learn it through technology, yeah. learn it through books, learn yeah. it through film, all of those things. Because yeah. that's the way that English is represented to us yeah. Oh, yeah. In, yeah. in today's society. So so let's um, so let's do it that way for Hung Kaminam. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, to me, I, I know like 
uh, singing and drumming in the context uh, uh, that we're talking about right here, right now, is quite different from when I learned to sing and drum. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do that anymore. Um, I learned in the ceremonies. Yeah. And you had to be right on. Mm -hmm. You had to be correct. Yeah. There was no fooling around or playing with it. It was, it was like le learning an opera. Mm -hmm. You you had to be exact. Uh, yeah. uh, that realm has changed quite a bit. Because uh, I know when we were kids, you made a mistake two or three times. Say get off, mm -hmm. get off the floor, quit that mm -hmm. until you learn. Go outside and learn. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was always that pressure when I when when I was young to be able to sing and drum, and uh, just getting up there uh, 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 with a drum in your hand, looking like you know what you're doing, and if you have doubts in your mind, it'll it'll grow, mm -hmm. it'll expand in your mind that doubt. Yeah. Uh, 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 but in a good, friendly way, fool around way, it's a good way to learn language. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So hey, that's that's all the time we have today. Uh, thank you, Larry, so much for coming mm -hmm. in and sharing your time um, and your knowledge with everyone. Uh, and thank you all for uh, for your comments and your questions and kind of sitting around with us while we kind of take this yeah. deep dive into language. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Coming up for the learning circle, we have uh, in December we have one or two more, two more sessions. Um, Denise is going to come in and talk to us about the science of attachment and emotion, and then we're going to end the year uh, with a conversation on sexual well-being. Um, so please stay tuned for that mm -hmm. one. And in regards to learning uh, language in particular, we're hoping to have a language follow-up session in the spring. So if any of you watching have any suggestions on who you'd like to see represented on that, um, please feel free to email us. We'd, mm -hmm. we'd love to take your uh, suggestions. Until next time, I think that's that's all we have. So, Haichka. Uh, thank you. And Haitsepka, all of you that, uh, that tuned in today. Take care. <laughs>